My name is Ellis Jones. I'm a professor of sociology at College of the Holy Cross. I'm also author of The Better World Shopping Guide and The Better World Handbook. I'd just like to um, begin by acknowledging a couple of things. First of all, my privilege. Uh, I'm white. I'm a man. I grew up as an upper middle class household, heterosexual. Um, was kind of raised a uh, Christian light. Um, in essence, I've experienced most of the privileges that we offer in our society, which means I am more blind than most people to the suffering on this planet. I have the most to learn. That's what all that privilege means. It means it's my responsibility to listen. There's been too much of that privilege taken for granted. Capitalism is a system in which economic wealth or capital is used to produce goods for sale, or in other words, to produce new wealth. And there are forms of capitalism in which production and distribution are governed by cartels or monopolies, fixing prices and permitting no competition. American capitalism is quite unique. There never has been a system quite like it in all history. So let's examine the structure of American capitalism. General Motors, for instance, is just a group of people who with their dimes and dollars are producing products for sale. There are more than half a million stockholders with their savings invested in General Motors. And why do they invest their dimes and dollars? They want to make a profit. It is a normal, wholesome motivation. Dr. Gaines, I once heard a clergyman say that the profit motive is not a good motive. Do you agree with him? I'm sure the clergyman wasn't a socialist or communist, but that happens to be what the socialist and communist say about the profit motive. And yet, most converts to socialism and communism joined up because of the promise of personal benefit or profit. Would a clergyman be able to fill his church if he told prospective members that there is no personal reward or profit in giving one's life to God? How many of you students study at dinner each evening instead of having the momentary pleasure of some favorite pastime? I think you would want to say that study can be work. What motivates you then? A desire for learning, a desire perhaps for good grades, but with the belief that in the end you will render a more valuable service and receive more for it. If you didn't hope to profit, you wouldn't study. What I'm trying to say is that the profit motive is active in most human behavior. That's important to remember. So I want to talk about um, how we spend our money. When I was thinking about shopping, I began to investigate how our economy works, both in the US and worldwide. It is a powerful system. It shapes this planet. At some level, everyone understands that money is power. Money matters. And when you have a lot of money, you have a lot of power. In this country, the Founding Fathers were actually very suspicious of power and the ways that it could worm its way back into the system and corrupt it. So democracy and spreading that power out among the people was the best way in their eyes to keep that corruption from happening. So the whole idea of democracy is a suspicion of power. And I think an important one. We have applied democracy to our political system. I wanna talk about how we have not examined our economic system in this way. We don't have an economic democracy. We don't even think about it in those terms. And yet, it is the one way we know about that keeps power in check, in theory. When it is flourishing and functioning properly, democracy is the answer to the corrupt nature of power. So, what I would like to propose is that we take this democratic model and we begin holding the economy to the same standard. 
our economy and the global economy. Because there is too much power in that system accumulating in the hands of the few in a way that corrupts it. And we need to bring it back into balance. And the way we need to do that is by bringing democracy to the economy. So when I think about dollars, I essentially think about them as votes. Every dollar is a vote. That means the average family in the US has about 22,000 votes that they can spend in any given year on things that are not like taxes or rent or you know, medical expenses, things that you don't really have a lot of choice over. The next thing to keep in mind is that, again, we're still here in the US. Today, the US economy is the most powerful economy in the world. And two thirds of the most powerful economy in the world, it is estimated, is driven exclusively by consumers. This means that the most powerful economy in the world, in the global economy, is essentially driven by us. We don't have 100% of the votes. We have 60 to 70%. But wow, that is a powerful global engine. And that shapes global circumstances. So what's going on in the economy with our votes? Some people have a lot more votes. Is that right? Is that okay? Maybe we need to have some tougher conversations about how many votes you have, because if you have 200,000 times my voice in a democracy, that doesn't seem right. So you can open up some very interesting conversations once you start to hold the economy accountable to democracy, which I think is something almost everybody believes in at some level. I'm going to compare two things that are not exactly comparable. What I'm gonna look at here is GNP, which is gross national product, or GDP, gross domestic product, doesn't matter which right now, which is essentially the way um, it demonstrates economic activity. So countries with high GNPs or high GDPs are the ones with the most powerful economies in the world. They generate enormous economic activity. And in fact, when we rank countries, how, how powerful or advanced or would we like to live there, those kinds of rankings, or who gets to go to the G8 summit and who gets to kind of play these political games, we do this essentially by GDP. If you're at the top of this list, you get to play with the big boys. The second thing I'm going to compare it to is profits, net profits for corporations in any given year. Now, it's a little different. A corporation is not a country. You know, it's like Apple and Exxon. These are just businesses. So it's different. Also, corporations are parts of economies, so some of those dollars are being counted on both things that you're comparing. So the comparison is not great. But what they share is a unit of analysis, which is a dollar. So we measure GDP or GNP, and we measure profits in terms of dollars. This is 2010 World Bank data on GDP around the world uh, compared to the revenues of global corporations. The United States is number one in 2010. Then the Eurozone, European Union, Japan, China, Germany, France. This should all sound very familiar. Oh yeah, these are the powerful countries, right? And you keep going down and down on the 2010 list. 21, Belgium. 22, Poland. 23, Walmart. So Walmart, just below Poland and just above Sweden. And you keep going down the list. 32, Argentina. 33, South Africa. 34, Royal Dutch Shell. That's Shell, the gas station. Shell. ExxonMobil at 35. Then Thailand, United Arab Emirates, British Petroleum. Theoretically, if these corporations declared themselves countries tomorrow, that would be the power of their economies. 
the things on this planet that hold the most economic power. Half of them are corporations in 2010. So let's go to 2015. Let's update. By 2015, 69 are corporations and 31 are countries. That is over two thirds of the most powerful entities on the planet are now corporations. That is a lot of power in five years to displace all of those countries off the list and have only a third of them left. So now we have United States, China, Germany. You see China has moved up. Uh, and then we get to nine, Canada. And now 10 is Walmart. Now Walmart, that was 23. In five years, they're now 10. Then Spain, Australia, Netherlands, and then you get State Grid and China National Petroleum and Cinepec. Then there's Royal Dutch Shell, there's ExxonMobil, there's Volkswagen, there's Toyota. I see CVS where you get the, the drugstore. CVS, the drugstore, is number 43. What? Then AT&T in total are above Argentina. Verizon is above Finland. Chevron is above Indonesia. Right? This is a serious accumulation of power in five years. But see, I want you to get a sense that power is accumulating. This monetary power is moving from the hands of nation states and into the hands of corporations. And if we don't start to think about those corporations as things that need their power held to account, they will bend those countries to their own devices. They will take those democracies and they will bend them because the democracies aren't wielding as much power. So sustainable, responsible impact investing, it's a strategy to maximize financial return and social good. It's a way to invest in line with your values. There's three components to SRI, and that's the screening, so you can avoid industries or companies you want to avoid. There's shareholder advocacy. As a shareholder, you have a right to make an impact, to engage with companies, to vote on shareholder resolution. And then community investing is providing capital to individuals and organizations that otherwise might not have access to capital. So some examples would be on the screening side, you could avoid fossil fuel companies, you can avoid weapons companies. On shareholder advocacy, some examples are you can engage with companies on climate change, on their footprint, their environmental footprint, on the products that they're producing. You can also engage on political contributions, supply chain conditions, diversity on boards of directors, executive compensation. There's a number of issues you can engage with companies on. And community investing, an example would be microcredit organizations uh, supporting nonprofits domestically or internationally and you get a return on your investment. The whole idea is to get a competitive, a good financial return and do good. I'd like to talk about an experience I had while I was in medical school. I was fortunate enough to get a scholarship to go to South Africa. And it was in the middle of the time when there was apartheid, which was a horrible situation. And I was able to see the devastating impact it had on the black people in that country. And so when I came back, there was a, a beginning of a movement called divestment for apartheid. And uh, that divestment was taking our money that we have invested in and insisting that it not be used to invest in anything to do with South Africa. People did that from all over the world. Whoa, stop! I've tried. I've listened to everybody on TV and radio. I've read the papers and magazines. I've tried, but I'm still confused. Who's right? What's right? What should I believe? What are the facts? How can I tell? Well, my friend, if it's any consolation, you're not alone. Many voters are in the same boat right this minute. Words have been flying at you hot and heavy. You've heard the pros and cons, the cons and pros of both sides. You've listened to people you believe in and people you've never heard of. 
It's not surprising that you're confused. But beyond all the words, beyond all the claims and promises, there's actually just one big thing on which most people base their final decision. Product advertising. Product advertising is everywhere. It is on the television, it is through the airwaves, it is everywhere and it's manipulation. It's there specifically to get you to buy that product. It's on the product itself. You pick up the product, oh, that's kind of, that kind of looks good. You look at it, it's advertising itself to you. And that's the worst form of information. When we talk about being good economic citizens, the word is ethical consumers. We want to be ethical consumers. We want to hold power accountable because we want a power to be more ethical. We want these corporations to do right by people and right by the planet Earth. Social and environmental responsibility. That's what we want from them. We don't want them to abuse human beings and we don't want them to poison this planet so that it's unlivable. It's very basic. But as consumers, how do we figure out who is doing this work and who is just talking about it and who is just lying to us? So the advertising doesn't tell us much usually. It's just manipulation. So sometimes people look at the labels themselves and they look for little labels, little clues, like fair trade labels that say, you know what, the workers abroad that are working on these things, we're gonna to try to do right by them. Greenwashing is essentially when companies lie about their environmental responsibility and or their social responsibility, like how they are treating people on the planet. Greenwashing is when they say they're doing great things and you have to tell as a consumer whether or not they're telling the truth. So the question is which companies are just practicing PR, public relations, to try to convince you to buy their product, and which are practicing what they call CSR, or corporate social responsibility, which is supposed to be the way that companies behave responsibly. Aquafina and Dasani, these are the two biggest competitors. Aquafina has this thing called Ecofina, where they are actually designing their water bottles with less plastic. It's something like, 20, 25% less plastic that's being used in the water bottle. So that's 20 to 25% less junk in the world. Dasani is actually coming up with this thing called plant bottle in which they're using like 30, 20, 20 to 30% of the plastic is made directly from plants, right? So then that's not petroleum, right? But it still can be recycled, so it's not gonna ruin that system but now it's from plants. So now this is what you look on the label. You see, oh, plant bottle and Ecofina. Now, in my system, I rate companies from A to F because I give grades to students from A to F. And we all know what an A is, and we all know what an F is. Which one is the good guy, which one is the bad guy? A B and an F. Does anybody know Aquafina and Dasani are actually brands? They're not the names of the companies. What are the company's names? Coca-Cola and Pepsi. That's what the companies are. So those are the companies behind those brands. So these are the things that need to be held accountable. Pepsi and Coca-Cola, not whatever face they give us, because they have a thousand faces, but the companies themselves. So we're gonna hold these companies accountable with our dollars. How do we do so? The most popular way to think about this is just thinking about the environment. And if there's anything I learned about this work early on, is that it's not just about the environment. That's only part of it. If we wanna do this right, we gotta think about human rights. We gotta think about the sweatshops, people in the developing world, children. We have to think about the environment. We have serious issues like global warming, pollution, energy, renewable energy, etc. We have to think about animal protection, animal welfare, factory farming, animal habitat and testing, community involvement. We have to think about local business, independent businesses, family farms, growing sustainably at a community level, really empowering communities rather than empowering corporations, and we have to think about social justice, fair wages, issues of racial, sexual, uh, uh, gender discrimination, economic discrimination, health and safety issues, um, etc. 
And these are the five ways that I think we should hold companies accountable. Do they treat these areas with respect? Do they treat them the way that will help us build a better world holistically? Here's a short list of the data sources. I use about 75 data sources now, and I dig back just over 30 years to get at this data. Let me tell you, this is some of the hardest data to track. If you think it's hard to figure out a politician and their track record and whether or not you should trust them, try it with a corporation. They are doing everything they can to keep this data hidden. And then I generate these charts. This is for clothing. A plus to F. Every now and then in these ranking charts, I will put something on the chart itself that is not a company. Does anybody see what's up there that's not a company? It's used clothing stores. If you really want to be a responsible consumer of clothing, you can't get that at a store. You got to get it secondhand. That is the absolutely most responsible thing to do. By far, better than the best company. This 20 worst list doesn't change very much. One, two, and three have not changed over time since I started early 2006 publishing the first book. ExxonMobil has always been the number one worst company on the planet. ExxonMobil, up until uh, about 10 years ago, was consistently the most profitable com company on the planet Earth. Having said that, 10 years ago, they were pushed off of that spot by another company, Apple. And at the time, Apple got a B. It still runs right around that B range, even though it's a huge company. And yet, what it means is, you don't have to sacrifice everything to be the number one most powerful company on the planet Earth. You don't have to. And that means, just like every now and then you can vote in a good politician, every now and then you get lucky. And you vote, and that person's really pretty good. Right? And later on, historically, they're up there. These are good economic entities. The 20 best companies. Now, you'll, the funny thing is, of course, every name on this list you recognize. Almost every name. These, these names, what? You know, half of them you don't even, never even heard of. These are often small companies. What allows them to be so responsible is they keep it small and local and they don't grow into these huge profit-making machines because it's not all about profit for them. Sometimes they get big. Method and Seventh Generation, Organic Valley, those are all, you can find those in Target now. You can find them in Walmart. And let me tell you, these companies are actually some of the most profitable companies of their size. And in fact, one of the reasons we know this isn't just by tracking profits, but many of these companies are being acquired by those larger companies who have bad track records because, not because they want to be responsible, but because they see how much profit is being made because they're attracting so many votes. So many of our dollars are starting to go to these companies trying to support them and saying, you know what, do that with my money, do a little better. Let's try to help a little bit. And it's working. Now the system is not kind of a clean slate and so these big companies can still muster quite a bit of power and gobble up the smaller companies. It's never without a cost. I've also, as a way to try to help people start this process, begun to organize a kind of list that shows you where you get your most bang for your buck. Like if you're gonna start thinking about, well, how do I make some of these changes? What it makes the most difference? You wanna do the thing that makes the most difference? Change your bank. Because most banks, most of those big banks that all of us know by name, they are some of the worst companies that we have. They are very unaccountable. They almost brought our economy down with them. And if we hadn't bailed them out, they could have. Next, work on where you gas up, right? Find the best option for your gasoline. Then start to go through supermarkets and retail stores. Where do you shop? Because they take a cut of everything. 
So if you go and you can buy, you know, you can buy the Organic Valley product now or the Method product at Target or you can buy it at Walmart, it turns out it's better to buy it at Target, right? Because they'll do a little better with that cut. The system makes you work for it. This change is not easy. It's again, it's like, I don't know how many of you have, have sat down and really dedicated yourselves on any given election. I've done this a few times. I'm gonna really make this one count. I'm gonna get the ballot beforehand. I'm gonna look at all those issues. I'm gonna see all those candidates. I'm gonna really try to make the right choices this time and really inform myself. That is, that is almost impossible to do. Impossible. This stuff is just like that. This is hard work. Okay, my name is Robin Retmer, and I'm the Chief Operating Officer for Amity Foundation. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about Ellis Jones and the Better World Shopper, and some ways that we here at Amity have um, made, uh, made practical application out of the book. We have an awful lot of people who are in our care that have a lot of needs and we purchase through a lot of various companies. In the last several years, um, really due to uh, us really paying attention to Ellis Jones's book, we have been able to uh, change a lot of the vendors that we've been working with. So we ensure that they're good vendors and have a high rating. Uh, we want to make sure that the vendors that we're using are eco-friendly and um, socially friendly and uh, fit more with Amity's mission. Um, some other changes that we've made really um, through being aware of the book and, and really being serious about utilizing it, we've made um, just in the last month um, some drastic changes and we're changing banks. Uh, the bank that we were using um, does not have the same values that we do and we have identified two banks who do that are willing to work with us and we're very thrilled about it. And again, we can feel like we are making a contribution to what's happening in our world today in terms of climate reality and in terms of social justice and some of those issues. I had an experience where I was uh, had my money in a bank that was I found out was investing in private prisons at the time when private prisons were being used to really treat people abusively and it's still going on today so I took my money out of that bank and went to another place that I knew was uh, in, investing their money appropriately socially responsible in the shopping guide I've laid it out so that you, people get rankings on one page right and then they get a little summary on the other page that, that highlights, you know, um, who the good guys and the bad guys are. There's a website that people can go to. Now it has a search capability. It just got overhauled. So you can type in a company and see how good they are or bad they are. There's a smartphone app that's free that people can download and they can keep it in their pocket. So they don't have to have a book on them at all the time. They pick up their phone, look up the product, find out what their ranking is. Please. Contact me at any point if you have any questions, and um, I promise to get back to you. Well, my work is really about social and environmental justice, and it aligns, I think, perfectly with Amity's mission statement, in which they are promoting those very same values in their work in the world. It's really important that organizations and efforts like ours come together so that those issues, those values are then expressed and multiplied.